Creators of Rick and Morty love hiding sneaky little Easter eggs in their episodes. They hint at potential plot threads, inspire fan theories, and just show affection for the shows that inspired them. Regardless of the reasons for the references, it still prompts fans to scour back through the episodes and analyze every frame. Today we're going to be looking at the secrets that they've hid in plain sight, and talking about what they could mean for the rest of the show. Hold on now, before we get started, subscribe to us. You'll join the notification squad and get frequent updates on new content. Wow, this is a big one. Somebody probably tracked it in last week on the bottom of their shoe or on a piece of alien fruit. Someone? Get off the high road, Summer. We all got pink eye because you won't stop texting on the toilet. Rick accidentally brought parasites with him. The fan favorite episode Total Rick All plays about with the protagonist's perception of reality and the reliability of their own memories. The episode revolves around parasitic aliens who take on a disguise and influence the memories of those around them. Would everybody just relax for a second? There's no such thing as an Uncle Steve. That is an alien parasite. This way the aliens are able to make their victims think that they're a loved one who's always been around them. The downside is that they can only fabricate positive memories, not negative ones. The episode revolves around Rick trying to work out which of his family and friends are real and which ones are imposter aliens. How did the aliens get there though? Well in an earlier episode, Rick gets his hands on some big glowing green rocks. Although at first it doesn't seem like a big deal, at the very start of Total Rickall, we can see him trying to dispose of some of those rocks in the bin. And what were living on those green rocks? Small purple aliens life forms. So it seems like Rick accidentally brought the alien menace home with him and the small aliens got out of hand. Although we have to say Rick trying to dispose of them by putting them in the bin doesn't exactly seem like a surefire way of getting rid of them. Oh, sorry, I, I was expecting- A Rick partner? Lesson one, rookie. Expect the unexpected. Now get in! Morty's origin. Rick and Morty might be the characters we know and love, but their history is pretty unknown. When Rick and Morty starts, they've already known each other and been on adventures with one another for a little while. There have also been a lot of little hints given in the show, that our Rick and Morty might not be each other's first. The Morty that we know and love has been lightly implied to be Rick's second or maybe even third Morty. When we get to see through Rick's memories, we see a 14-year-old Morty, then followed by a memory of Rick with a baby Morty. Rick shouldn't have any memories of a baby Morty if it's true that he disappeared from the Smith family for 20 years. So if he's not Rick's original Morty, then who is? Well, he could be dead. After all, Rick does have a very weird relationship with Morty, unable to decide if he loves him or not. However, Rick's first Morty could be the evil Morty. The intro of the show shows Rick leaving Morty stranded in a dimension of giant frogs. Some fans believe that this was Rick's original Morty, and the one that would ultimately become evil Morty. Relaxed enough? <laughs> I admire you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, <here's th> <laughs> Rick's crime is destroying worlds. It's no secret that Rick is a very wanted man. In fact, he's the most wanted man in all the multiverse. But it's never been clearly explained. What could Rick have done to make so many people want him in jail? Destroying multiple worlds is probably a good example of a crime. Yes, Rick has already ruined one version of Earth that we know of. Rick accidentally Cronenberged up the world and took Morty to an identical version of that world, save for the mutant nightmare apocalypse. Okay, well, sometimes science is more art than science, Morty. A lot of people don't get that. In this world, he and Morty both died. Rick buried his own dead body and seemed remarkably nonchalant about it. So this might be something he does kind of often. In the very first episode, Rick attempts to destroy the world and start again. While Rick passes out, that bomb is never disarmed. That was all a test, Morty. Just an elaborate test to make you more assertive. It was? Sure, why not? I don't, I don't know. Could the series really open with Rick destroying the planet Earth? When you consider that Rick disappeared for 20 years, it seems likely that Rick merely replaced a dead version of himself, albeit one that died long before he arrived. Rick is also fairly reluctant to say what dimension any of his family are from. Could it be that he just plain doesn't know? Has he been through so many dimensions that he doesn't even know where he currently is? You're always wrong. In the episode Raising Gazorpazorp, Morty finds himself in an awkward situation. Through his own teenage antics, he's managed to become a father to an alien. When Rick and Summer go to the alien's home planet, they find a world divided. Everyone on the planet is one of two stereotypes. While all the men on the planet are big, hulking cavemen-like people with little thought outside of food, fighting, and women, the women themselves are very different. The women are overly dressed, speak fancily, are constantly gossiping, and play up opposite stereotypes from the men. They also greet each other with, I am here if you need to talk. Although it's interesting that both aliens are hyper-exaggerated versions of the human sexes, it also gave us a funny hidden joke. On the Queen's throne, there's Latin writing. It reads Cis Simper Columnium. 
That roughly translates to you are always wrong or may you always be wrong. The translation isn't exact, but it's the closest. It's another witty little secret that the creators put in. Although it'll probably be missed by the majority, for those who can figure it out and those who read about it, it makes for a good laugh. <laughs> and these babies just saved this lame ass party! Wubble up a dub dub! Play something. Some somebody play something. Alien Rick Dance. The episode Rixy Business revolves around a giant party. Rather than the kids throwing it, it's the grandpa, and we get tons of aliens visiting them. Unfortunately for Morty, the party accidentally gets teleported to another part of the galaxy. A dangerous part of the galaxy at that, one with giant killer aliens. Morty is obviously unhappy at that fact and wants to go home. Instead of taking them back, Rick goes full frat boy and crushes up an alien crystal and snorts it. From there, he's entranced and motivated to perform the Rick dance. That's a super choreographed yet also party appropriate dance. He's joined by several people at the party. Morty, on the other hand, just wants to be back on his own planet and he's not especially happy about Rick's dancing and crystal snorting. He throws the crystals outside, but before Rick can grab them, a large alien tentacle picks them up and takes them away. While the two of them bicker, a few shots later in the background, we can see a giant, very happy alien dancing with his tentacles up in the air. He's spinning around exactly like Rick was. So one thing is certain, those crystals can make anyone dance. Mr. Meeseeks. In the episode Me Seeks and Destroy, Rick gives the Smith family a Meeseeks box. They exist to help you out with your task, then they vanish out of existence. Jerry asks a Meeseeks to help him take two strokes off his golf game. Ooh, yeah, can do. Unfortunately for Mr. Meeseeks, Jerry is hopeless at golf. The task grows harder and harder until eventually Mr. Meeseeks decides to use the Meeseeks box himself in order to get his own helper. It's not enough. Jerry eventually ends up with an army of Mr. Meeseeks, all trying to help him with his golf game. Eventually the Meeseeks go crazy and attack. If they kill him, then they've taken two strokes off his golf game. Once Beth finally helps Jerry improve his golf game, they all disappear. The Meeseeks aren't seen again until the episode Morty Night Run, where an alien can be seen playing a pinball machine with a Mr. Meeseeks next to him. A few seconds later, he vanishes away, having completed his task. Existence is pain for a Meeseeks, so we're glad that the new ones get easier jobs. Huh. Tell me, Rick, what do you desire? Eh, I make my own stuff. So what are you, like, the devil? Beating up Randall. Something Rick in This Way Comes mainly spoofs the Stephen King story Needful Things, in which the devil opens up a shop and gives evil items to unsuspecting customers. This prompts Rick to open up his own business where he uses science to de-evil the villain's gifts. This puts Rick at odds with the devil. Their businesses start to compete and the devil just can't seem to keep up. Summer, who's been working at Needful Things, tries to help the devil. Unfortunately for her, the devil is a deceiver, and he stabs her in the back and breaks her heart. You're Zuckerberging me? I was Zuckerberging people before Zuckerberg's balls dropped. Summer is understandably pretty sad, and Rick takes it upon himself to cheer her up. Rick uses science to roid him and Summer up to Arnold Schwarzenegger proportions, and they beat the devil to a pulp. That's not enough, though, as they go on to beat even more people. One of the guys they beat down is some guy in the playground, and fans of the Disney Channel may find him a little familiar. That's because the guy looks extraordinarily like Randall from Recess. Randall, who's always been a snitch and frequently the antagonist to the kids in Recess, gets pounded by two muscle-bound behemoths. And to be honest, it's hard to feel sorry for him. Yeah, bro. We, we totally yeah. worth it. We did it. <laughs> we just pulled it off. <laughs> yeah, bro. <laughs> yeah. Tune in to Rick and Morty season three in like a year and a half. The reason for the fourth wall breaks. Rick and Morty isn't a show that breaks the fourth wall very often. Although it does occasionally joke about the structure of movies and stories in general, there are only two characters who frequently break the fourth wall. The first and most famous is Rick. Rick breaks the fourth wall addressing the audience directly and saying things like, Ooh, we'll be right back. He also came up with his own catchphrase and talks about how the show's gonna go on for several seasons. Why is this? Well, despite it just seeming like a random collection of jokes, some fans have theorized that Rick knows he's in a TV show. There have been little secrets to support this theory sprinkled throughout the show, but it's most heavily supported by the final episode of season two, in which the character Mr. Poopy Butthole is revealed to have been watching the last episode on TV. Hoo-wee, what a cliffhanger. Oh boy, oh my. That's a real crazy ending, huh? Seeing as he's clearly had many adventures on TV, some fans believe that he's informed Rick that he's on a TV show, and that's why Rick is depressed all the time. There have been quick little lines the writers put in to support the theory too, like when Rick says he refuses to answer a literal call to adventure. I refuse to answer a literal call to adventure, Morty. Let it go to voicemail. Grunkle Stan's Stuff. 
Rick and Morty's creator Justin Roiland is a longtime friend of Alex Hirsch, the creator of Gravity Falls. Having both worked together at Disney before Roiland went his own way, it's not surprising that the shows have a few references to each other. Gravity Falls suggests that Ford travels between universes all the time, and we already know that Rick Sanchez is all about interdimensional travel. So in the episode Close Rick Counters of the Rick Kind, Rick opens up multiple portals to other dimensions to try and cover his tracks. One of them spews out a mug with a question mark, a notepad, and a pen. This is a direct reference to an episode of Gravity Falls when Grunkle Stan loses those exact items through a portal in the episode Society of the Blind Eye. It's a fun reference and one that hints at a connection between the two. It's not the only Gravity Falls reference either, as an image of Bill Cipher also appears in the show. While we doubt we'll ever see a proper collaboration, seeing as the shows are owned by rival networks, Cartoon Network and the Disney Channel respectively, it's still fun to speculate on how the two shows could be connected. Time Travel Stuff Rick and Morty is heavily inspired by Back to the Future. As a matter of fact, Justin Roiland actually got noticed by Dan Harmon when he made a vulgar parody of the Rob Zemeckis classic for Harmon's film festival. The skit was eventually adapted and expanded as the show Rick and Morty. Yet, despite being inspired by the adventures of Dr. Emmett L. Brown and Marty McFly, so far no time travel has occurred in the show. There are hints that it could happen though, as Rick does possess a box filled with time travel stuff. Although the box, much like the idea, has literally been shelved. Part of the reason is that introducing time time travel would be a massive headache for them to explain and write a consistent story around. That being said, the time travel box is a nice little easter egg for the fans. The show has dealt with time being frozen before and it made for a pretty fun episode where Rick, Morty, and Summer's timelines were out of sync with the rest of the world. But the idea of that happening every time they want to travel through time could be a little grating unless they found some way to explain it away. So for now, Rick and Morty is leaving time travel to the professionals. Rick and Morty is one of the most popular shows out there, and its fan base is not to be messed with. Devoted Rick and Morty watchers have a serious love for the show, so much so that they investigate every little detail and come up with some of the wildest fan theories out there. Sometimes it seems like the fans know more about the show than the creators themselves. Hit the red subscribe button to be the first to know of all of the swiftiest Screen Rant content. There's a bunch of people strapped all over that building! Not people, Morty. Mortys. The character of Rick is such an enigma that most fan theories out there center around trying to better understand what makes the smartest man in the universe tick. But does anyone really know what Rick is thinking, or even if he is the Rick we think we know? This fan theory asks just that question, when it supposes that the Rick we follow on the show isn't the original Rick from that timeline. They propose that the Rick who originally belonged in this universe actually died when Beth was young, rather than abandoning her, and the Rick we know and love simply popped in and replaced him years later. The 20 years that Rick spent away from Beth and her family really raised some questions in Rick and Morty fans' minds, and this theory expands on that gap, but takes it to another new direction. It states that Rick never actually left, that he remained in Beth's life the entire time, but then something happened, something so unforgivable that Rick erased the family's memories of him for the last 20 years and fabricated the story of his disappearance instead. Whatever it was, must have been pretty bad for a decades-long abandonment to be the happier alternative. Another big question in fans' minds is the question of who's Beth's mom. In Season 3, Episode 1, we almost got the answer. But that backstory turned out to be faked by Rick. Left to their own devices, fans came up with a pretty awesome explanation. They suggest that Unity, the hive mind capable of entering and controlling the minds around it, who has a long romantic history with Rick, might actually be Beth's mom. It would have had to have been another woman's body being inhabited by Unity for this to make sense, of course. But in the Rick and Morty universe, anything truly is possible. Another fan theory takes a crack at Beth's origin story, and this one really takes the cake. Remember Miss Frizzle, the redheaded teacher from the Magic School Bus? Well, one of the most popular theories out there is that Miss Frizzle is actually Rick's ex-wife. Think about it. They're both scientists, they both have technology to shrink down and travel within the human body, and to travel into space. Fans have gone so far as to suggest that Miss Frizzle's famous Magic School Bus was won by her in their divorce. Not to mention that Summer has red hair, which is known to be a recessive gene, skipping a generation and passing from grandparent to grandchild. Now that's a crossover episode we're dying to see. <laughs> I could do whatever you do and more, baby. 
One more theory exists about Rick's wife, only this one isn't so much about who she is, but where she is. Some fans seem to think that something went wrong with an earlier version of Rick's portal gun and that Beth's mother was sent into the unknown. They think it could explain why Rick is so depressed and angry and why we don't really know what his greater mission is. He's searching for her under the guise of causing general mayhem. Just when you thought you knew the family, along comes a theory that ponders if Rick is actually Morty's father. Fans of this theory think that Rick and Morty aren't actually related. The multiple Ricks actually just place Mortys with the family to protect them until they are ready to start going on adventures. Speaking of family, apparently there might be another grandchild of Rick's out there and she might be closer than we think. According to a fan, it's possible that Tammy is actually another granddaughter of Rick from another universe where she was born instead of Summer. Tammy seems to look a bit like Beth and has the same hair color as Jerry. She also is smart enough to live as an undercover agent, fooling even Rick himself. Perhaps his abandonment of her timeline sent her on a quest for revenge, leading her to join the Galactic Federation in order to track down her grandpa. While we're on the subject of Tammy and the Federation, there's an interesting theory out there about how they were finally able to track down the Rick from our timeline. In the pilot episode, Rick has Morty smuggle megaseeds through interdimensional customs, and when they get caught, they wind up jumping through a portal and appearing in the middle of a cafeteria at Morty and Beth's high school. Fans concluded he was spotted by Tammy at the high school, who goes on to befriend Beth in an effort to get closer to the family and keep tabs on Rick. If only Bird Person could have been spared in the process, right? Why was Rick so desperate to get his hands on those mega seeds, though? We know that they temporarily cause hyperintelligence, but if Rick is the most intelligent person in the universe, then why would he need them in the first place? Could it be that the mega seeds are actually what makes him so smart? Some fans think so. Since we never know what Rick is drinking out of his famous flask, some have put two and two together and decided that it's actually mega seed juice and that he is constantly drinking it in order to maintain his exceptional intelligence. You gotta do it for Grandpa, Morty. You gotta put these seeds inside your butt. In my butt? Come on, Morty. Please, Morty. You have to do it, Morty. Whether it's mega seeds or just a generally high IQ, we all know Rick is smarter than just about anyone else out there. So smart, he might actually be aware that he is the star of a television show. He breaks the fourth wall in almost every episode and is constantly referencing the fact that what we are watching is in fact episodes. So this fan theory actually seems pretty likely. It also adds to his rebellious nature as he is fighting against the creators who keep him contained within the show. If Rick is stuck inside a TV show, what show is he contained in to be exact? Fans wonder if he and Jerry are actually still trapped in the simulation from the mind-blowing episode M. Night Shyam Aliens. Stringing together clues from the episode like a recurring alien that turns out to be a Plutonian and the disappearance of Jerry's tuxedo, some out there make the case Rick and Jerry are forever trapped in a treadmill-like simulation created by alien David Cross. Could the entire show take place within the video game Roy version 3? The original Roy that allows the player to live out the life of a normal man until his death was introduced in an earlier episode, and some believe the show is simply a part of the Ultimate Roy game. But this time, Roy is Morty. Someone at the arcade has played the character of Morty from birth and still plays today. Aren't you handsome? Thank you. <laughs> I'm Jerry. Oh, I know you are. Oh, Jerry, the unfortunate father everyone loves to hate, or hates to love, in Beth's case. Some theorists have suggested Jerry is actually not the Jerry we started out with, but was switched out for another version when Rick committed him to the Jerry daycare in season two. Rick was either given the wrong ticket to pick him up, or didn't really care which one he got, and nobody ever noticed. The Morty we know and love might not actually be the only Morty whose adventures we follow after all. Some believe almost every episode of Rick and Morty follows a different pair of Ricks and Mortys. We know that our pair belong to Earth C-137, but there seems to be a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that we might be following the adventures of Ricks and Mortys from other timelines without even noticing. This might even include a universe in which Rick had a plan to kill Morty. In Season 3, Episode 10, when Morty takes off with Rick's portal gun to protect his family, Rick later shows up with a gun, claiming he was going to kill Jerry with it. Some think his actual intention was to kill Morty, to prevent him from becoming another evil Morty if left to his own devices. 
Evil Morty intrigues fans so much there are a million theories just about him. One of them theorizes the Citadel of Ricks was constructed to defeat Evil Morty. Ricks are notoriously independent people, but Evil Morty must have been such a threat that they organized in order to take him down together. Clearly they haven't succeeded yet, but we definitely haven't seen the last of Evil Morty. There's a common belief our Morty is not this Rick's original Morty. In the opening titles, there are multiple moments that look like they could be fatal to Morty. This includes getting eaten by three green aliens, and most fans believe this actually happened. The original Morty died on an adventure, and like we have seen him do, Rick simply hopped into a universe with an existing Morty and either a dead or missing Rick, and kept on from where he left off. Another slightly more obscure theory is all Mortys eventually become Ricks. This one is a bit tough to untangle, but the general idea is that Morty will grow into Rick, and the reason Rick has taken Morty under his wing is to try to prevent this from happening. But Rick, being the flawed person he is, continues to make the same mistakes as he always has, leading Morty to eventually become as jaded as he is, and they just keep going around and around forever. Most people who watch the show understand Rick suffers from some serious depression, but this theory suggests the character of Rick might actually represent depression. Dan Harmon has talked openly about his struggles with it, and has hinted Rick's manic behavior one minute and depressive behavior the next might be a metaphor for the illness itself. Nothing you do matters! Your existence is a lie! To continue along a more mystical path for a moment, some fans actually have come to the conclusion that Rick is God. Because of his ability to observe himself on a TV show, the way time seems to move differently around him, and his, well, huge god complex, the idea that the creators of the show would make an atheist scientist character into the Almighty himself is an idea that viewers of the show love to speculate about. Similarly, another popular theory states Rick is somehow immortal, and either he has created an immortality serum or devised some other way to cheat death entirely. Considering Rick, it doesn't sound too far-fetched. While we have seen other Ricks die in the past, perhaps our Rick is the only one to figure it out. One extremely existential fan has come to the conclusion the show is an explanation of the nature of human consciousness in its entirety. Rick represents each one of us, and every different universe and world are representative of the different parts of us, our ideas and emotions and how we see the world. Put that in your squanch and squanch it. One of the best parts of Rick and Morty are the little side characters who show up for a minute to delight us. One of these delightful characters is Noob Noob, the janitor we meet in Season 3. Fans love him so much that they investigated a theory about him, that Noob Noob is actually part of their favorite TV show, Ball Fondlers. In trailers and clips of the show, we see a helicopter pilot who looks almost exactly like him, and fans have concluded they are one in the same. Another favorite side character is Mr. Poopy Butthole, the friend of the family that Beth accidentally shot when she mistook him for a parasite in disguise. Fans think Mr. Poopy Butthole is actually a parasite after all, but a much stronger one, hiding in the world, pretending to be Mr. Poopy Butthole to infiltrate the world around him, or it. Here's hoping he's not an evil parasite and that we see much more of him in Season 4. One of the most awesome theories out there is that the entire show is all about ice cream. There's a ton of ice cream in Rick and Morty. Characters of all kinds eat and talk about it in many episodes. So much so that it has led fans to wonder if the real reason Rick and Morty returned to this particular timeline is because Earth is the only planet which has invented real ice cream. It might be amazing if it turned out to be true, but this theory does sound a little ridiculous. The show Rick and Morty is one heck of a ride. If you know anything about it, which you probably do because why would you be watching this, you know that in it, the characters are tossed between an infinite number of realities, planets and dimensions, which is enough to give you whiplash from the comfort of your living room. Or more realistically, the bed you haven't left in days, let's be honest. Because the characters jump between parallel universes, fans of the show have developed multiple theories about hidden plot lines that the Adult Swim writers created, but are hidden to the common Eye. Let's dive right into one theory which keeps popping up. Evil Morty is Rick's original Morty. And this one actually makes sense. Let's go, in and out, 20 minutes adventure. When we're not sharing quotes, making memes, or finding the hidden Easter eggs tucked into episodes, Reddit users are popping off suggesting multiple far-fetched theories such as Rick knows he's on TV, which is why he sometimes breaks the fourth wall, duh, and that Rick and Jerry never left the simulation, meaning the entire show could be a simulation of itself. Oh, for God's sakes, that's enough. 
While we have enjoyed sifting through these many threads of hopped up fans, the theory that stuck out for us is, drumroll please, we hope you didn't mind the title of this video, that Evil Morty is actually Rick's original Morty. Though it may seem like a stretch, we believe the fans of the show have really done their homework on this one. And by homework, we of course mean binge watch this series again and again with total reckless abandon. Okay, buckle up, it's about to get weird. So, when you read the official description of the show, it says that Rick Sanchez has been MIA for around 20 years, and suddenly arrives at his daughter Beth's doorstep, looking to move in with her and her family. We're led to believe Morty grew up without a grandfather, and was deprived of that special male bond that comes from hanging out with a twisted old white dude. But in Season 1, Episode 10, we see from Rick's memory that he is holding a little baby Morty. If he was off gallivanting in who knows what universe, it doesn't make sense that this picture's exist. Again, a photo surfaces on the episode Get Swifty in Season 2, where Morty sees a photo of Rick holding a baby Morty on Bird Person's wall. These two photos simply don't add up. Either the person in charge of continuity on the show should get fired, or these are clues to something bigger. Something better. Our theory is that the baby is not the Morty we know and love, but is in fact a different baby. That's right. Hold on to your hats. We think C-137 Rick has that memory from a different dimension where he raised a different Morty, then seemingly abandoned him. Now, we know what you're thinking. Would Rick do that? Ditch one Morty for another? Well, in the Rick Lantis mix-up, we meet Lizard Morty, the result of Rick combining a lizard and a Morty. Someone please alert PETA. And in close Rick counters, we see Rick electrocuting a Morty. So, from this, we gather it's pretty clear Rick has no issues with putting Morty in harm's way. Because Rick seems to have no attachment to worlds or other people, so it's not crazy to suggest he could swap one Morty for another, especially considering how easily he could access a new Morty in the process. The attachment is never fully there, knowing he could find another Morty with just a quick change in dimensions. And the pictures themselves are completely different as well. Morty's a baby in both of them, but they showcase different ages. This suggests Rick was around a lot more often than we were originally led to believe, or at least around some version of Morty long enough to snap a couple pics. Ooh la la, someone's gonna get laid in college. In this alternate world where Rick is raising Morty, we think something went awry. Because Rick is, shall we say, not the ideal father figure, we think that his baby Morty got corrupted along the way and became evil Morty. Our theory is because Morty doesn't have Jerry. He never developed a deep-seated and crippling insecurity. Instead, when raised by Rick, he learned how to be incredibly full of himself and intelligent. All other versions of Morty are, shall we say, not the sharpest tool in the shed. So, we believe that Evil Morty must have been with Rick a long time, and his intelligence rubbed off on him. So what happened in this alternative universe, you ask? How did Rick part ways with Evil OG Morty? Well, we think the answer is in the opening scene of the show. In it, Morty is taken by his grandfather to his spaceship for the first time. But Morty's demeanor is remarkably chill. I don't know about you, but if my grandfather dragged me out of bed and put me in that flying piece of trash, I would at the very least be amused. Sure, having to ride shotgun next to your drunk grandfather is not the ideal scenario, but you're still flying in a spaceship. We think this isn't Morty's first time flying. We think this is evil OG Morty, and believe his attitude is reflective of him jaded as hell, and simply wanting to go back to bed. Also, while the man is a certified booze hound, he is particularly twisted in this scene. Is it because of something? Did something happen that drove him to drink in such a reckless way? Rick says he wants a fresh start, but from what? We think he wants a new relationship with a new Morty, a Morty that isn't evil or hates him. So maybe he wants an original evil Morty to die in the crash so that he could adopt a new Morty in another universe. But the plan goes awry. Morty does live, and Rick doesn't realize. Rick pieces out, and evil Morty is left abandoned on a desert planet. So this Morty is stewing with the abandonment, and we meet him again in episode 10. We think evil Morty, wanting revenge or some sort of misguided sense of closure, studied Rick's notes and created the Morty Matrix in order to lure him out of hiding. If you're not yet convinced, listen to a couple lines we pulled that we believe is undisputed evidence. In the episode Close Rick Counter of the Rick Kind, Rick says, A cocky Morty can lead to some big problems can be a real bad thing for everybody. As if he's speaking from experience. We think that Rick is having a particularly poignant case of deja vu, and it's not sitting well. 
While the counter could be that we've seen other cocky Mortys on the show, think of Police Officer Morty and Untoxic Morty, there's something about his tone in this scene that leads us to believe that Rick knows what will become of him if he keeps showing these traits. In the same episode, Rick tells Morty that he's the Rickest Rick, but does not affirm Morty's assertion that he is the Mortiest Morty, which is perhaps further evidence that this is not his original Morty. In the closing lines of dialogue from an episode 1 in season 3, Rick is speaking to Morty and says, I replaced them both as the de facto patriarch of your family and your universe. Notice how Rick said your universe, as if he were implying that Rick doesn't share a link to that particular Morty in any universe. So what an evil OG Morty's behavior points to their sordid past? Well, remember how evil Rick is being controlled by evil Morty? Well, that means everything evil Rick did and said to Rick is coming from evil Morty. So when evil Rick says, Ricks don't care about Mortys, that is being scripted by evil Morty. Seems a little personal, no? He also cuts down Rick and tells him he isn't as clever as he thinks he is. Again, maybe that anger is fueled by something more than a general hate for Ricks. It could be evil Morty flexing his vendetta against him that is fueled by a lifetime of having to deal with poor treatment from his father figure. Why else would he want to copy Rick's memories and then kill him? Lest we forget that when looking at these memories, Rick wells up when he sees the picture of baby Morty. Maybe that stir of emotion is caused from the deep regret Rick feels from the way things turned out. Cool. Oh my god, I can't believe this. So if we put this all together, it goes a little something like this. During the 20 years Rick C-137 was missing from Pilot Universe, he raised an incredibly intelligent Morty, then treated him like dirt in classic Rick fashion. Then this little Morty grew up and challenged Rick's intelligence. Something happened between them that split them apart. Some theorists suggest that maybe he also Cronenberged evil Morty's world like he did with the Pilot Universe, or he simply abandoned this Morty to find a better one. Rick flees to another dimension to assume the role of a grandfather and step in when Morty has actual parents raising him. We use the term actual loosely because, well, Jerry. So we think that's why he is so eager to teach Morty about the ways of the universe and use him as a sidekick. But this time, do it right. Rick's guilt about evil Morty makes him treat new Morty a better, which helps strengthen their bond. This could also explain Rick's wacky rant at the end of episode one, where he says he may have found the perfect Morty. Not smart enough to rebel or get too smart for his own good, but courageous enough to be his sidekick. Rick and Morty forever. Forever a hundred years. <laughs> Clearly something happened in the way evil Morty was raised by Rick that made him no so perfect and allowed Rick to abandon him easily. But when evil Morty finds Rick, he controls evil Rick so he can trap original Rick. He wants to sift through his memories, maybe to get some closure on what happened between them, and then tries to absorb his intelligence, showing that he is the one in power now. While we obviously love how the theory fits because it develops the evil Morty character significantly and shows how complicated Rick is underneath it all, there are some holes we would like to address. The first being that the baby picture evidence could be easily debunked by an assumption that Rick could have stopped in to visit Morty when he was small, but we think that's a little too easy. The bigger issue is that because we're dealing with an infinite multiverse, there are infinite Ricks and Mortys playing out infinite versions of themselves, regardless if they're evil or not. Heck, there is probably one universe in which evil Morty is raising a Rick. That's the problem with this show. Anything's possible. The writers could have also just tried to retcon the whole 20 years thing by shoehorning some random visits by Rick when Morty was younger. And now it's your turn to weigh in. Wait, time to go, Morty. Fans everywhere are on the hook for the next season of Rick and Morty, and we just can't wait to see what adventures are in store. But there are some things that even the biggest, most dedicated, and boy are they dedicated, fans of the show might not know. The show has plenty of secrets and awesome behind the scenes gossip, so let's get scratching. Show me what you got. Ah, uh, the Szechuan sauce. Whoever thought that a cartoon TV show could actually cause its fans to riot? And we're not just talking over message boards. If you don't know, there was a joke at the very end of the season 3 premiere about a McDonald's special Szechuan sauce that was only released for a limited amount of time when the Disney movie Mulan opened in 1998. And I'll, and I'll, I'll go out and I'll find some more of that Mulan Szechuan teriyaki dipping sauce, Morty. There was such a demand for the sauce after that episode aired that McDonald's actually brought it back. Only they didn't stock enough. In fact, Fans literally rioted. Luckily for show creator Justin Roiland, McDonald's actually sent him a whole bottle of the stuff. 
If you know anything about Dan Harmon, you know that he is a huge 80s and 90s pop culture fan. He really knows his stuff and has found some really clever ways of sneaking in references wherever he can. One of the most subtle that you may never have noticed is the car that Morty's dad Jerry drives. It's actually the famous Wagon Queen family truckster that was featured in the cult hit National Lampoon's Family Vacation. Harmon's tense relationship with Chevy Chase from their time on Community might have also inspired the design choice a little bit too. Once we get to know and love cartoon characters the way they are, it's really hard to imagine any other voice coming out of their mouths. This is very true for Jerry, who's brilliantly voiced by the lovable and sometimes perfectly pathetic Saturday Night Live alum Chris Parnell. I remember feeling that way about a young lady named your mom, and that's not an urban diss. But if they had gone another direction, Jerry might have turned out entirely different. Breaking Bad's Brian Cranston actually auditioned for the role, and while we will forever love him as Walter White, we'll stick with our Jerry the way he is. Thank you very much. That's not the only involvement Brian Cranston had with the show, however, though he might not even know about this next one. The now infamous Pickle Rick episode instantly became a fan favorite. I turned myself into a pickle, Morty! Boom! Big reveal, I'm a pickle! And it was actually inspired by an episode of Breaking Bad, specifically the one where Walt's van breaks down in the desert. Creator Justin Roiland was inspired by the idea of Walt, totally trapped, without the equipment of people he might normally lean on. He wanted to see how smart Rick was in the most isolated of circumstances, just like Walt. Get Swifty might not get regular radio play, but it remains one of our favorite tunes forever. The simple and yet catchy tune that Rick and Morty improvise on the fly in order to save Earth from destruction in a galaxy-wide version of the X Factor has some pretty surprising origins. While you might think it was written for the episode, the episode was actually written around the song, which Justin Roiland wrote when he was a kid. He wanted to prove to a childhood friend that it was a good song. Exactly. It seems a show like Rick and Morty would have a pretty adult rating, but actually they rarely pass TV 14. That's because the Cartoon Network branch Adult Swim that Rick and Morty airs on wants to make sure that the show stays on the air. Because of this, only two episodes have ever exceeded the TV 14 and made it to TV MA yet. The episode Interdimensional Cable 2 was the first, probably because of the repeated mention of a certain body part, and Vindicators 3, the return of World Ender, because of, well, all that violence. It's hard to talk about one space and time traveling animated series like Rick and Morty without at least bringing up its predecessor, Futurama. And Dan Harmon knows this. In fact, during early promotion of the show, he likened it to a cross between Futurama and The Simpsons. And some fans have even wondered if Futurama and Rick and Morty take place in the same universe. Or multiverse, that is. People have spotted both the Slurm logo and the Planet Express ship in episodes of Rick and Morty, so who knows? While they might not want to be him, it seems that fans are interested in acting like Jerry, at least in one particular way. In the episode Big Trouble in Little Sanchez, Jerry is seen playing a game on his tablet that is very, very Jerry. Basically, quietly popping balloons, and that's it. Well, if you're looking for a piece of that action, you can actually play the mindless balloon popping game for real. It's called Rick and Morty Presents Jerry's Game. Futurama isn't the only world that seems to coexist with Rick and Morty, though it might come as less of a surprise that the other show that belongs in the Rick and Morty universe was created by Dan Harmon himself. That's right, there is a ton of evidence that signals that Community and Rick and Morty share a timeline or two. In the episode Auto-Erotic Assimilation, Rick even creates an alien version of Community before getting bored of it and moving along in classic Rick fashion. While it was on the air, Community gained a reputation for developing one too many inside jokes over the course of its seasons, and Dan Harmon wanted to avoid the same mistake when it came to Rick and Morty. So aside from a couple of recurring characters from season 1, they really pushed for new stories as much as possible in 2 and 3. On most shows out there, the process of developing, writing, and selling a pilot episode can take months, even years. But not for the guys behind Rick and Morty. Nope, the story goes that the pilot was written in only six hours. Not only that, but it happened on the same day that the show was bought by Adult Swim. Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland had just left the pitch meeting and immediately sat down together and finished the script by the end of the day. Jerry, I don't want whatever's happening here to stop. We always wonder where the crazy catchphrases come from, and Rick has his fair share of good ones. Possibly the most memorable is his classic, Wabba Labba Dab Dab! While some think that it was a reference to the iconic Russian novel Fathers and Sons, they are actually mistaken. It was written in the script as a nod to Curly from the Three Stooges, and history was made. 
While fans will forever miss Community, we actually might not have Rick and Morty if the beloved comedy didn't go under. After his unceremonious firing in season 3, Dan Harmon was suddenly unemployed and looking for something to fill the time. In the gap between him being fired and returning to finish the last season of Community, he started working on Rick and Morty with Justin Roiland. So while we may have lost our favorite study group, we gained a new favorite cartoon family. Bill Cosby is a touchy subject these days, and for good reason. But actually, the disgraced comedian has some very loose involvement with the creation of Rick and Morty. Or at least his legal team does. Back when he was making cartoons for Dan Harmon's website, Channel 101, Justin Roiland made one called House of Cosby's which featured a bunch of Bill Cosby clones. It was incredibly popular, but after five episodes, Cosby's people caught on and shut them down with a cease and desist. A suit yourself. Royland's next project was a direct result of that legal trouble. As something of an F you to the lawyers who had stifled his last project, Royland joined forces with Dan Harmon to create a very dark, very twisted version of the beloved 80s classic Back to the Future, called The Real Animated Adventures of Doc and Marty, with an H. Alright, Doc, that sounds great! The whole point of which was to further bother copyright lawyers. Lucky for us, Royland had so much fun recording the voices for these two characters and decided to veer away from using the cartoon as a protest, creating what would be the early prototype of Rick and Morty. It might seem difficult for a show that is often so absurd to cross over into the mainstream, but something about Rick and Morty just can't be stopped. An amazing example of this is the song Terry Fold, which was co-written by Royland and the indie band Chaos Chaos. Terry Fold started out playing on the radio in the background of the episode Rest and Ricklaxation before it was released on iTunes. But on September 23rd, 2017, it actually hit number 33 on Billboard's Hot Rock Songs chart. The popularity of the show has spawned quite a few different side projects, from advertising collaborations, to animated shorts, to comic books. The comic books have been an awesome way for fans to keep up with Rick and Morty during the show's long, long hiatuses between seasons. If you're a big fan of the show, you know that it mainly takes place in the Dimension C-137. But what might surprise you is that the first 10 issues of the comic actually happen in C-132, with a different Rick and Morty. If you ever doubted that Rick and Morty had worldwide appeal, look no further than the bizarre short film Brush World Adventures to change your mind. One year to the day after the surprise first episode of season 3 premiered, Adult Swim released this insane Australian version of Rick and Morty, created by Aussie animator Michael Cusack. While fans loved it, the mayor of the Australian city Bendigo did not, and went out of her way to clarify that her home is nothing like the way the cartoon portrays it. Hooey, what a cliffhanger! Oh boy, oh my! We mentioned before that the spaces in between seasons of Rick and Morty were longer than usual, something that hardcore fans didn't take too lightly. In an effort to keep interest up and fans subdued, Adult Swim also released a series of brilliant stop-motion short films, created by British animator Lee Hardcastle. Lasting only between 15 and 21 seconds, these little films parodied 16 of the most famous movies out there, from 2001 A Space Odyssey to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. They're all on YouTube, and we highly recommend checking them out. The fact that some huge advertisers jumped on the opportunity to partner with Rick and Morty really says something about what a massive sensation the show is. It seems like the last show anyone would want associated with their brand, but the ad execs behind Carl's Jr., Old Spice, and the movie Alien Covenant, no really, couldn't resist. An old friend even makes an appearance in the Old Spice spot, the Butter Robot. Poor little guy winds up eaten by a can of Old Spice, but at least it means an end to his existential suffering. Rick's unfortunate habit of burping, well, always, might seem to some like a result of his rampant alcoholism and general lifestyle. But it's actually more of a family affair than we realize. Sarah Chalk, who voices Rick's troubled daughter Beth, shares this trait with her animated old man. The actress can burp on command, whenever she feels like it. This is actually something that Justin Roiland is jealous of, as it takes a lot of effort for him to produce all of those mid-sentence Rick uh, burps while recording. Uh, uh, excuse me. In the first season of Rick and Morty, the writer's room was an all-dude affair. They've since switched it up, but the evidence of that still exists in the animation. There are so many random alien creatures in the show that the team decided to make designing them a little bit dirty. A ton of the background aliens you see are actually based off of the, well, male anatomy. Yep, they actually set out to make these creatures look like male body parts, and then threw eyes and mouths all over them. 
Almost every cartoon character out there will tell you that they are a fan of The Simpsons, or at least that they used to be for a long time. Justin Roiland and Dan Harmon are no different, and jumped at the chance to put their Rick and Morty spin on one of the beloved Simpsons couch gags. Of course, things got a little more rick ridiculous than the family from Springfield normally does. Rick and Morty crash their spaceship into The Simpsons' house, effectively liquefying the family. Don't worry though, things work out in the end. Sort of. The episode M. Night Sham Aliens is one of the best, with a ton of mind-bending twists and a guest voice by comedian David Cross as the leader of a group of aliens trying to trick Rick into revealing his formula for concentrated dark matter. It's a classic, but actually it was based off of something that happened to a friend of Justin Roiland. Apparently the guy had a bad acid trip and began to hallucinate aliens before winding up taking all of his clothes off in order to be invisible to the imaginary space invaders. It's no secret that Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland aren't afraid to let things get pretty dark in the Rick and Morty universe, is. But it actually could have been even darker. Originally, Roiland wanted every episode to end with a version of Earth getting destroyed. He thought it would be a funny recurring gag, but was ultimately outvoted by the other writers. Let's get out of here and go on a classic Rick and Morty adventure. Yeah, alright Rick, I'm all in! <laughs> Rick and Morty is a virtual compendium of pop culture references. From digs at Titanic to an obscure reference to National Lampoon's family vacation, the show's writers love to pay homage to what came before. But sometimes they do more than that. Sometimes they straight up steal from other shows, and we mean that in the best way possible. Uh, well... Pablo Picasso once said, good artists borrow, great artists steal. And Shakespeare shamelessly stole plot lines all the time. Wow. So the writers of Rick and Morty are in good company. What we're trying to say is, please don't say mean things about us in the comments, we're just the messenger. That is way too much pressure! Now without further ado, let's look at 10 times Rick and Morty shamelessly stole from other shows. So Rick and Morty is not the first irreverent cartoon to mercilessly skewer pop culture. South Park did it, and Simpsons did it before them. In fact, South Park did a whole episode based on that very premise just to prove the point. Sometimes you just have to take what came before and put your own spin on it. And they've been doing it for over two decades now. Likewise, the writers of Rick and Morty have raided the annals of science fiction to power the fever dream adventures of a crazed scientist and his hapless grandson. In the season 1 episode, Lawnmower Dog, Rick enhances Snuffle's intellect to the point where he becomes a cybernetic tyrant bent on world domination. If that storyline seems somewhat familiar, it's because it's a similar plot to the classic 1959 novel Flowers for Algernon, where an intellectually disabled man has a surgery that transforms him into an insufferable know-it-all, just like Snuffles. Without the whole world domination part. No, that part came straight from the film Lawnmower Man, about a simple gardener who becomes a megalomaniacal cyber god after his mind is enhanced by a computer. At least in Rick and Morty, Snuffles and his dog army get their own dog planet to call home. Which sounds a lot like Dog World, a show pitched by co-creator Justin Roiland back in 2012 that was ultimately rejected. Wow, a whole world populated by intelligent dogs. If there's one contemporary show that bears a striking resemblance to Rick and Morty, it's Cartoon Network's The Venture Bros. Premiering back in 2004, the show followed Dr. Rusty Venture, his bodyguard Brock, and his two homeschooled sons as they stumbled through a series of endlessly bloody misadventures. Go Team Venture! Including one where the boys are miniaturized and injected into their father to search for a chronic ailment. Not unlike the time Morty was shrunk down and shot into the guts of a homeless man where Rick had built an amusement park. Because nothing is sacred to Rick Sanchez. Granted, both of these are referencing the iconic Fantastic Voyage, but the similarities between the two shows don't stop there. Dr. Venture, like Rick, is a mad scientist who regularly puts his sons in dangerous situations, which often leads to their death. And when that happens, he replaces them with clones, not unlike how Rick is theorized to have replaced Morty with one from a different dimension. Did we have some sort of relationship with him? Both shows feature countless pop culture references, a parade of whimsical secondary characters, copious acts of violence, and a host of daddy issues. Okay, I got him. They're in... they're in his prostate. So how do we get him out? But wait, there's more! Rick and Morty has poached storylines from more than one episode of Venture Bros. In the season 4 finale, Operation Prom, Dr. Venture's repeated rejection by women leads him to create a love potion that, once activated, transforms people into mantis-like creatures that turn ravenous. 
That's right, some four years before Rick Cronenberg the whole world, Dr. Venture almost did the same thing. Fortunately for the Ventures and the rest of humanity, the infection didn't spread on a global scale as Brock Samson, their OSI-trained murder machine, put an end to the creatures in classic Brock fashion. With a giant friggin' knife. Maybe if Rick employed his services, they wouldn't have had to skip town and start all over in a replacement dimension. There are some striking differences, however, between the two protagonists. Whereas Rick is the smartest guy in the universe, Dr. Venture is a trust fund baby living off of his father's legacy, perpetually on the edge of bankruptcy. But there are multiple dimensions in the Venture universe, and one features a super successful version of Rusty Venture. So I guess what we're saying is, Rusty is like the Rick that eats his own poop. I'm disgusted that my good name is being used for this, this baloney. Rest and Rick Laxation may not be our favorite episode, but it does have one of the best cold opens ever. After Rick pulls Morty out of a class for a quick 20-minute adventure, which spirals out of control into an epic space opera culminating in a nervous breakdown for our interdimensional adventurers, they go to a spa to detoxify. And detox they do. Literally. Their personalities split in two, with a toxic Rick and Morty and a non-toxic Rick and Morty. While Rick and his counterpart try to merge the alter egos, non-toxic Morty goes on a total ego trip and becomes a high-powered broker all of the Wolf of Wall Street, but with significantly fewer prostitutes and barbiturates. The idea of dueling personas is an old one, from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde to the Nutty Professor and even Family Matters. But Rick and Morty is not the first animated show to use it. It also serves as a plot in Dexter's Laboratory. In the episode Dr. Dee Dee and Dexter Hyde, the titular character creates a good and bad version of himself and his sister Dee Dee. And just like in Rest and Ricklaxation, Dexter and Dee Dee have to merge with their other selves and restore the status quo. Anybody who's ever watched a couple episodes of Rick and Morty knows it owes a debt of gratitude to Back to the Future, the iconic time-traveling adventure from 1985 about a hapless teen, his bad scientist friend, and, uh, uh, incest. Because the 1980s were a very different time. When, uh, when incest jokes were funny, we guess. We... we don't know. But when I kiss you, it's like I'm kissing... My brother. Like Rick, Doc Brown is unscrupulous in his pursuit of super science and deals with some unsavory characters. In this case, a band of Libyan terrorists. Did we not mention there's a subplot with terrorists because there totally is? I think we can all agree that this is a total Rick move. But Doc is not a total dick towards Marty. After all, he does help him get back to the future instead of letting him die on a giant frog planet. Like Rick might have done. No, to understand the dynamic of Rick and Morty, we have to go further back to another time-traveling duo, Mr. Peabody and Sherman, which follows the time-traveling adventures of a know-it-all scientist and his hapless sidekick. Granted, Mr. Peabody isn't the same grade-A jerkhole Rick is, but he's every bit as condescending and reckless as you'd expect a talking dog to be. Just ask Snuffles. The writers of the show must have an affinity for Stephen King, because he gets referenced a whole lot throughout the series' run. For example, the episode Something Ricked This Way Comes plays as a condensed version of Needful Things, a novel which was later made into a movie in the 1990s. The so-called testicle monsters voiced by Jordan Peele and Keegan-Michael Key bear a striking resemblance to the time-eating Langoliers from the film and book of the same name. And the Lawnmower Man, which we mentioned earlier, was based on a short story written by the horror master himself. Even the title for Rick Shank Redemption is a reference to King's famous story, The Shawshank Redemption, which also got a movie treatment. Has King written anything they didn't make into a movie? As you'll recall, the plot of Shawshank involves a man escaping from a prison by deceiving his jailer, the same way Rick does in the episode. Albeit Rick does it by hopping from the body of one host to another like some possessed spirit. Because if you're gonna copy someone else's homework, you should at least jazz it up a bit. Relaxed enough? <laughs> I admire you, Rick. <laughs> If you got the Robocop and Red Dragon references and Raising Gazorpazorp, you may have missed more obscure references. Specifically, a callback to the cult classic, Zardoz. Released in 1974, Zardoz features a post-Bond Sean Connery and a red nappy. Also, a giant floating head that spews forth guns for some reason. Lots and lots of guns. That same head can be seen on Gazorpazorp, spitting out sex robots for the Gazorpazorpians to, uh, breed with and stuff. Also, this is not the only episode to feature giant floating heads either. 
The Gazorpians, an aggressive and violent sort, are similarly inspired by the warlike tribe Connery is a part of in the film. If you've had the privilege of watching Zardoz, you'll know it's absolutely bonkers and would not be out of place in an episode of Rick and Morty. However, that's not the only obscure film referenced in the episode. It has a similar plot to 1993's Bad Boy Bubby, wherein a man is kept indoors by his mother who lies about the outside world being poisonous. Morty tells the same lie to Morty Jr., his baby Gazorpazorp, as a means to keep him indoors and prevent him from going on a murder spree. Like in Bad Boy Bubby, Morty Jr. escapes captivity to explore the world around him. If you're a fan of Adult Swim, you've surely seen their groundbreaking 2014 short, Too Many Cooks, which starts off in typical sitcom fashion by introducing the show's main characters and then continues to introduce more and more characters until things get a little crowded and violent. If any of this sounds like it could be a Rick and Morty episode, that's because it totally is, and it is glorious. Season 2's Total Recall operates on the same premise, by introducing more and more characters by way of shape-shifting parasites until it turns into a bloodbath. After the Smith family figures out how to distinguish the parasites from legitimate family members, they massacre the imposters with an arsenal of weapons designed by our favorite dimension hopping grandpa. It was a fun episode until Mr. Poopy Butthole, Ooh -wee. a character everybody totally suspected of being a parasite, was shot by Beth. Because living with Rick Sanchez means making terrible, terrible mistakes and then drinking away your problems. We're just so glad he's okay. The second episode of Season 2 saw the return of Gearhead. Do you even know my real name? It's Revolio Clockberg Jr. The Gear Wars aficionado from the Season 1 finale, as well as a brief me-seeks cameo at Blitz and Shits. It also saw the introduction of the universe's most agreeable assassin, Crumbopulous Michael. I just love killing! Who gets crushed to death when Morty rams him with Rick's spaceship. A decidedly baller move he might have picked up from 1988's Midnight Run, where bounty hunters routinely use motor vehicles to incapacitate their targets. The episode's punny title, Morty Night Run, is also a direct homage to the Robert De Niro vehicle, where he goes on the run from the authorities with a wanted fugitive. Just like Rick and Morty do with Fart, the interdimensional gas cloud that, spoiler alert, turns out to be a genocidal maniac. One of the most memorable parts of the episode features a series of fart-induced psychedelic dream sequences that pay homage to Vince Collins' Malice in Wonderland animated short. Oh, and the sequence features a David Bowie-inspired musical number sung by Jermaine Clement of Flight of the Conquered's fame. Phew, that's a lot of references for one episode. Here comes another funny! Mad Max Fury Road made such an impact, it's no big surprise the writers of the show chose to parody it in the third season. The episode opens up with Summer blowing away an angry mob of dystopian scavengers a la Max Rokostansky, proving once and for all that Summer does not need a sentient spaceship to take care of herself, thank you very much. Keep Summer safe. No, 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 don't hurt anybody! However, it's not just that Mad Max film that's being parodied. The writers also took inspiration from Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, the third installment of the Mad Max franchise. In that movie, Mel Gibson's Max was forced to battle inside the aforementioned dome with a chainsaw, a sequence that remains one of the best in the franchises. Like Max, Morty is also thrown into a Thunderdome arena by Rick to keep their hosts distracted so he can go about his business, stealing the powerful Isotope 322 to fuel his tech. Not unlike how the writers steal from other shows to fuel Rick and Morty's adventures. Ooh-wee! Is that show meta or what? <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but we're itching for a new season to drop. Until that happens, I guess we're just gonna rewatch all our favorite episodes. What did you think of this video? Which are your favorite references, homages, and plot lines? What films or shows do you want to see lampooned in season 4? Tell us in the comments section below, and while you're at it, why not do the right thing and subscribe to our channel for more videos about your favorite animated shows?